Thank you very much for the introduction. And thanks also for um, inviting me and for giving me the possibility to give this talk. Um, so, yeah, so as Alberto said, this is a joint work with, uh, with Jean Lago, who is a postdoc in medicine, and Arno Pauli, who most of you probably know, is a um, professor in, in Swansea. Um, so, let me start off by, uh, wait, okay, by um, stating the main question we will try to um, answer today. And the question is, okay, if I give you an ill-founded linear order, how hard it is to compute a descending sequence through it? So, this is the problem I'll be calling uh, DS. Like, do you see the pointer, right? If I move the pointer, you see it, right? Yes. Okay, Yes, cool. we do. Um, thanks. So um, this is the problem I'll be calling DS for this talk. And well, a short answer is it's pretty hard. Um, well, it's pretty hard in general, at least, let's say. Um, it's, a, it's a known result that there are uh, computable linear orders without uh, like not even hyperarithmetic descending sequences. Um, so we know this problem is not gonna be easy, right? There's no hope for it to be computable, to be arithmetic, not even hyperarithmetic. And this already sets a difference between the problem DS of computing a descending sequence and who is like a natural, uh, like a natural comparison is with the problem ADS, which stands for ascending or descending sequence, which means like, which is the problem um, given a linear order, infinite linear order, either compute an ascending sequence or a descending sequence. Um, so it's known that ADS is, is fairly simple in comparison, it's, it's an arithmetic problem, and so there's no hope for these two problems to be equivalent, not even computably equivalent. But today we will mostly focus on the uniform computational content, and this is usually framed in the, um, in the let's say, in the language of IR reducibility. Um, so I'm, I'm not really going to, you know, make up a full talk on virus reducibility. Um, most of you are probably somewhat familiar with it. Um, but, you know, just, just to be sure that we're all on the same page, I, I, like my point is, I, I would like to just give you the idea, main idea of like how things, like how things work and what's the intuition behind the definition we give. Uh, so we start from a represented space which is a complicated name to say that you have a set and you have um, a way to assign names to element of the set and the name is just an element of the bare space. So you use the bare space to assign names to elements of X. And if you consider two possibly partial, possibly multi-valued functions among represented spaces, you say that F is virac reducible to G if there are two computable functionals phi and C which works as follows. So um, I, you start from a name of an input for F, then you use phi, the forward functional, so-called forward functional to produce a name for an input of G. Then you apply G and you get a, a name for an answer. Then you use uh, the backward functional P. Sorry, sorry uh, Manlio. Uh... Yeah. Uh, can you just, the notation uh, on the second line, uh, delta x with the, yeah. with this inclusion means that uh, delta x is defined on a, only on a subset of yeah it can be partial right Sorry. Ah, okay so in particular like any subset of the bare space is a represented space uh, trivially yeah. yes okay, okay. in okay. general yes that's true like the okay. bare space can be seen as a represented space by trivially by the yeah, yeah. entity and and if you have a, a represented space, any subset is a represented space by just the restriction of the map. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, but yeah, sorry for not mentioning this. Um, this is this means possibly partial, and the same here, right? So the, the two functionals. I'm not assuming here that the two functionals are total. They can also be partial, uh, but they have to, you know play like they have to work as, as, I, as I was saying, right? So um, again, you just, you start from a name, you compute an imp, a name of an input for F, you compute a name for an input of G, and then you apply P to both the output of G and the original input. And then you get a name for a solution. So, so 
the the um, so let's say the, the the carry home message here is that you work with names. So this is a critical point, and we'll see in a bit that it will really come into play. Um, let me just quickly mention that if you don't allow access to the original input, then we talk of um, strong viral reducibility. We use this symbol here. Um, it, it just means that um, the, the, the backward function is not allowed to have uh, access to the original input. Um, right, so usually you think of multivalue functions are, are, as problems, computational problems. And so clearly there are many ways you can combine problems together in order like like also intuitively in many natural ways you can you know you can ask for uh, both so you, you can say oh you have you have two problems and you may ask okay i want a solution for both f and g and this is captured by this uh, operation here which is called parallel product um similarly you, you can do the same with finitely many instances of f so you say okay i want K many, um, I have K many inputs for F and I want to solve all of them in parallel. Similarly for infinitely many, um, we recently introduced somewhere, some, an operation which is somewhat in between these two. So you ask for finitely many answers, but you don't want to commit to a finite number. Um, like, like you don't want to commit to any finite number, so you don't really know how many you will need, but you need you know that you will only need finitely many. Um, this this star here is is uh, intuitively captures the is it's called compositional product. Intuitively, it captures the idea of applying G first, then doing something computable, and then apply F. So if you want, you solve G and then F in series. Um, this is somewhat like the composition of two problems, but you're allowed to do something uh, computable in between just to, you know, take care of possible, uh, you know, small differences in maybe maybe the fact that the codomain of G doesn't really match exactly the domain of F. Um, then you have this operation here, which is called jump. Um, now, uh, let me just spend two words on this. This is like, this is just nothing like, like the name is really not the best choice, maybe, uh, because these are very little to do with the jump, as you might might expect from you know classical computability. Uh, in particular, it's not um, it's not monotone, it's not degree theoretic, and it doesn't really have to produce a problem which is strictly stronger. So uh, it's an operation that somewhat re is is a reminds of a jump uh, of a Turing jump but uh, like its algebraic properties are very different and it's defined as follows so the name of an input for the jump is a sequence of it's a sequence of strings in the bare space which converges in the limit to an instance of f to a name of an instance of f and then the output is just f of x but the 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 trick here is that you you work with the with the representation for your input, which is weaker. You intuitively first have to solve the limb problem, and then you can solve f. And of course, there are many other. I'm I'm not really going to present all of them. This is just to give a a, a broad overview. Um, two words on virus reducibility on strong reducibility. Um, as I said, the idea is that you um, don't have to use the original input to solve your problem. And and to like in practice, a, a useful notion is the, the so-called cylinder. Um, so this is a formal definition of being a cylinder. It means that the, uh, if you ask, uh, if you if you want to solve id, id is just the identity on the base space. Id times f. This is just uh, as hard as solving f. Uh, strongly, like this reduction always holds for standard virus reducibility, but doesn't always hold for strong virus reducibility and well the intuition is just that well you don't really need to use the original input because you can recover it from the solution of f and basically there's this theorem which essentially captures what i wanted to say about cylinders and the fact that if you reduce to a cylinder then you then it's equivalent you can equivalently reduce or strongly reduce to f it's it's the same 
Um, this is very useful uh, in practice because, especially when you want to show non reducibilities, because in that case, you can just assume that the reduction is a strong virus reduction and, you know, just the technical details it gets a little bit more like simpler. Um, so finally, we get to, to our problem, the problem I'll be talking about. Um, so how do we phrase this problem as a as a, a computational problem, like as a multi-valued function on represented space? Space. So the, the represented space is the set of linear or countable linear orders. And so the way we represent a linear order is by its characteristic function. Well, the characteristic function of the relation, right? Yeah, you use a standard a standard uh, pairing function and you just have the characteristic function of uh, the set of pairs in the, um, the set of pairs that are in relation. Um, and of course, like if I give you the characteristic function, then it's computable to say whether A is less or equal than B. Uh, so the problem uh, formally defined is the following. So I give you a linear order and you have to produce a, uh, an element of the bare space, which essentially like codes the descending sequence the, the most natural, possibly the most natural way, right? Just by enumerating the sequence. Uh, well, of course, the, the domain is the set of ill-founded linear orders. Otherwise, there's there's no descending sequence you can even you can produce. Um, just just two words on this problem for now. Um, this this problem is called BS, which stands for bad sequence, bad sequences. And it's it's the general it's the it's a natural generalization of DS in the context of quasi orders. So again, the set of quasi orders can be seen as a represented space. The representation is again the characteristic function of the relation. And but the, the thing is now the most natural thing to ask is not really uh, to find a descending sequence, but rather to find the bad sequence, which uh, well, uh, Raphael did say this, this many times already, but uh, in his course. But um, yeah, bad sequence is. Um, uh, just just a sequence which like just uh, intuitively is a sequence that never goes up right so it's it's a, it's a it's a mix of an anti chain and descending sequence formally you ask that for every i less than j xi is not below xj and of course and again the domain has to be the set of non well quasi orders because otherwise there's no bad sequence in it so just just uh, by you know, phrasing in the context of virus reducibility as standard argument, we can see that these two problems are strongly equivalent. And therefore, I mean, I'll be talking for, for the first half of the talk, I'll be talking mainly about DS, but it may be useful to keep in mind that the results also hold for, for BS. Um, so, okay, so let, let's just um, try to dig a bit into it. Uh, so first useful result, which, you know, allows us to get rid of uh, the differences, ba basically the differences between virus and strong virus reducibility is the fact that DS is a cylinder. Um, this is actually an exercise, but I think it's useful to, you know, we, we can just, um, we can just read the proof very quickly. I mean, if you think about it for five minutes, you will probably get to the same solution because it's, it's, it's it's totally natural, but the idea is that, okay, formally speaking, we want to show that um, we can solve uh, both the, ide the identity problem and, the, and an instance of the S by just an instance of the S. So you start from a string, which is the input for ID, and you start from a linear order, which is an input for the S, and you have to produce a single input for the S. Well, what you do is you compute the, uh, another linear order, which, which you may call M, whose domain is the set of pairs n and a prefix. This is, this is the symbol I use to, to mean the prefix of length n of the string p. So right, you pair n with the, with the prefix of length n of p. Uh, this, this is the, the field of the order. And of course, you order these pairs just by looking at the first component. So basically, what you have is a computably isomorphic copy of um, of the linear of the original linear order, and and if you if I give you an infinite descending sequence through M, then you can trivially compute a, a descending sequence through L. But also you get longer and longer prefixes of P, and therefore you can uh, recover your original string P. Um, right. So this means that basically we will not really have to worry about too much about strong reducibility in this talk. 
Um, so let so to 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 better describe the strength of the S, let me just make a small detour and and say like really two words about uh, the connections between VAR degrees and reverse mathematics. Um, so usually when you work in reverse mathematics, you study the strength, the proof, the 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 demonstrative strength of of theorems, right? But um, an observation, uh, standard observation, is that many theorem can actually be written in this um, in this form, which is like for every x there is a y such that if x satisfies some formula p, then the pair x and y satisfies some formula p. So this can be natural see, naturally seen as a computational problem because I can I can say okay I give you an x which satisfies p of x. And you have to produce me a y which satisfies c of y, c of x y. Sorry. Um, so, so this connection has been very well explored in the literature. Um, uh, so, so we can, if you want, we can draw many uh, parallels between uh, the reverse mathematic hierarchy and the bar of degrees. And um, yeah, right. So, so this is this is this has been explored rather well known, but. So let me let me just tell you what happens. Um, in some sense, the identity problem is the analog of ICA naught, and that's just because the identity problem sort of corresponds to computable problems. Then you have um, this this problem here, which uh, is, is should be read as choice on the on the Cantor space, which is actually like another way to phrase weak Koenig's lemma because this can be phrased as uh, um, given a binary, infinite binary uh, tree, compute a path through it. And this is essentially weak Koenig's lemma. Um, lim, the problem lim, which is the problem of finding the limit in the bare space, and it's iteration, so applying lim one, two, three times, n times, uh, so are the analogs of ACA naught, and that's just because lim sort of corresponds to the, the Turing jump. And that also connects to the, the comments I was making before about the jump in the virus lattice. Um, then at the level of ATR not, the things get a little bit messier and you don't really have uh, a single analog. This has been very well, um, very well presented by the work by Alberto and um, Arno Pauli and Takagi Kiara. Um, so where, where they present many possible analogs of ATR not in the context of um, bio, 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 bio degrees. Um, so, so natural candidates are, are these two. This is the choice on the bare space, which can be can be seen as um, given an ill found. Well, I mean, I'll be saying two more about them in a second. Um, so finally, at the level of uh, pi one one comprehension. You have this problem, which is um, essentially well. Key pi one one can be seen as the characteristic function of well-founded trees, subtrees of the bare space, and its parallel parallelization corresponds to asking many pi one one questions and answering all of them in parallel. So, so when you, when we want to, you know, um, have an idea of how strong is the S of of, of, its, of its uniform strength, like. Then the most natural thing to do is probably to, you know, pick some some problems and try to to uh, estimate the degree of the S, the VARF degree of the S. Um, and 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 since we since as we said, the S may not have hyperarithmetic solution. We, this means that it has to be placed at least at the level of AT or not, right? In some sense. So here's what I was anticipating. So these two problems, choice on the bare space and unique choice on the bare space can be seen as, well, choice on the bare space is given an ill-founded tree, compute the path through it. And UC bear is just the restriction of C bear to trees with a single path. Um, so these are like two natural problems we can try to compare the S with. And, and therefore like this first result is the following, the S reduces to C bear and does not reduce to UC bear. And again, the proof is just two lines, so we, we might as well give it. Um, the reduction um, of DS to C bear is, is fairly easy. You just uh, need to notice that if I give you a, a, a linear order, you can just build the tree of partial descending sequences. 
and this tree is going to be ill-founded because your original order was, and so you can you see better to pick a path. And uh, the non-reduction is actually more delicate, but it follows from the fact that any tree, any computable tree with countably many paths only has hyperarithmetic paths. And in particular, if you have like a tree with a unique path, then this path is going to be hyperarithmetic. And we know, as we said many times, that DS may not, like it has inputs, computable inputs with no hyperarithmetic solution, and therefore no reduction can hold. So this is the picture, how, uh, how the picture starts, starts to look like. And so naturally we, we may wonder what, whether like this reduction can be reversed like whether C bar is reusable or whether UC bar is reusable. And the answer is no to both of the questions, but to um, formally answer this question, I'll make a small detour. And I will, I will talk about two problems, uh, sorry, two operators on problems. One is the first order part. And the second one I'll be talking in the next slide is this called deterministic part. Um, the ideas for both is sort of similar, so um, let me just start from, from this one. This has been recently um, introduced, recently defined by Damir Zafarov, Riz Solomon, and Kita Yokoyama. Um, so so they, they, they um, introduced this notion, well, this was like the idea is not a completely new. There's been already somewhat um, used. In the literature, but like the the, the formal definition and, and and especially this characterization here is new. Um, so so as a notation of convenience, we can use this FO to denote problems with codomain n. Um, so if you for any for any pro computational problem for any multi-valued function, we define the first order part of F as a specific problem. So this is a, a particular uh, function. There's a there's a formal definition which I refrain to give to give to you just because it's it's a bit technical and it will take um, a bit of time just to go through it. But the the main feature of this um, of this uh, problem here is that well, first of all, it's first order, so it's a, it has codomain n, and it captures this degree. So um, this degree is the uh, greatest like the greatest degree of all the first order function which reduce to f so in some sense this first order part of f captures the most complicated problem which is which has codomain n and is still reducible to still is it is reducible to f now, now you can prove that this is a max so this is um, actually well defined um but the, the important and the important thing is that it's it's uh, it's degree theoretic, right? So in particular, if you have two problems which have different first order part, then they cannot be equivalent. So it's very useful tool to separate problem. Um, in the same spirit, but different, like let's say different operator, but same spirit is the deterministic part. Now, the difference is that you don't focus anymore on problems which have codomain n, um, but you focus on single valid problems. So you fix a represented space y, and you define the deterministic part of f with respect to y as the, again, this is a precise function, this is a precise uh, function here um, with codomain y, but it has the property that it um, it is the, in some sense, it is the most complicated uh, single valued function with codomain Y, which reduces to F. So again, this is, um, it is a degree, it is well-defined, first of all, it is a max, not a sup, and uh, it's degree theoretic, and, uh, and therefore, like, again, the, the idea is the same, right? If, if two functions have different first order part, if two problems have different first order, duh, sorry, if two problems have different deterministic parts, they cannot be equivalent. Um, just annotation on convenience, we will we will drop the subscript in case we talk about the break space, but this is just um, because we will mainly focus on the break space here. Um, so in the in so what I will be do, what I'll be doing now is to um, characterize the first order part of the S and the deterministic part of the S. Um, so let me introduce this problem here. 
Uh, this problem is called pi one one bound. Um, takes an input a finite pi one one subset of the natural numbers and intuitively produces a bound of it for it. So produces any b which is greater than every n in a. Uh, so in the input. Now I didn't define what what this represented space here is. I didn't give you the definition, um, and I will not do it. <laughs> But the idea, the main idea here is that um, a name for a finite pi one, well, finite doesn't matter, but the name for a pi one one subset of the natural number is a string in the bare space such that answering the question n belongs to A is a pi one one question with respect to this code, to this string. Um, so if you want, you can think of it as um, I give you a sequence of trees, one for each n, and uh, n belongs to A if and only if the corresponding tree is well founded. Uh, right. Um, of course, like uh, the domain of pi one bound is the set of finite set, as I said. Um, as as a as a as a you know as a, as a trick in the proof we can we can often use the fact that the input is actually not just a finite set but an initial segment of natural numbers and that's just because if I give you a finite set you can basically you can computably define a new pi one one set which basically you know you can you can fill the holes computably in in a sense right you can define this new pi one one set um, asking that if there's something greater which is in a then also n is in a m is in a right so um but again this are, doesn't really change anything this is just uh, a convenience in the proof um so well as you may guess this is going to be the first order part of the s but let me prove it okay to prove it we have to to show two things right one is that first of all the power one reduces to the s uh, which is usually the, the easy part in a sense. And the other one is that it is the most complicated problem that reduces to the S. Um, so let me start from the easy, easy direction, right? So uh, as I said, you can you can think of an input for pi one mount that's a sequence. Well, I said a sequence of trees, but if you consider linear orders instead, it's it's pretty much the same, right? Um, you consider you can think of an input for pi one bound as a, as a sequence of linear orders such that, well, the first k are going to be well-founded because they they correspond to the elements that belong to, 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 to your input and all the other ones are going to be ill-founded. Um, then given this sequence, you can just build the, well, the, the, you can just sum the orders, right? You can consider the, the concatenation of the, like the disjunction of the order um, ordered by lexicographical order, like on, on the sum, right? Um, now what happens is that, uh, any, like, well, first of all, this is going to be ill founded, of course, but, uh, moreover, every descending sequence is, has to be such that, well, if you take the first element, it's first element has to be, well, a pair and comma X and ha N has to be large enough so that, um, basically you have a descending sequence below this point, right? So it has to be in the ill-founded part of the order and therefore N has to be uh, at least K, right? Um, and therefore like to get a bound for, for your original problem, you, you just you just return N. Um, so this was the easy part. Uh, we, go, we now go to the, let's say hard part. Uh, what we show now to, to basically conclude the proof is that, um, if you have any problem which is first order, so it has codomain n, and this problem reduces to the s, then it already reduces to pi one one bound. So you don't have any any like any problem with codomain n that reduces to the s is not going to be harder than pi one one bound. Um, so okay, so this is just like um, a summary of what's happening here. Um, like this is just, let's say it's a, it's a it's a few lines that describe what a reduction is right so you start from um you assume that your problem reduces to the s and as i said you can re you can assume that the reduction is strong um then like like via two functionals right you have pmc 
which, which are the maps witnessing the reduction. You start from an input of F and we, we, we name like the, the order defined by P of X, is, we, we just name it um, less than X, right? Then what happens is that this order is going to be ill-founded. So you get the descending sequence from this, like on the, uh, through this order, you apply the backward functional to the descending sequence and this descent, this backward functional has to uh, produce a name for an output of F. But the name for an output of F is just like uh, natural numbers are just represented by a string and which, you know, uh, let's say N is represented by all the string that belong, that begins with N, right? So, so you only care about the first element and that's why you only care about the first element of the string. And, and you, and you, and like by, by hypothesis, this is going to be a solution for F. Um, but, and here's the trick, since, since the backward function is computable, in particular it's continuous, convergence happens in finite time. So we, we will not really need the whole descending sequence. We just need the finite prefix of the descending sequence to get a solution. So, so what do, so what we do now is the following. <clears throat> At any stage S, um, what you see is the, is the, if you want, what you see a finite portion is a finite subset of the of the order right um at that stage you can simply this is a finite order so you can just uh by extensive search if you want you can just uh, list all the finite partial descending sequences and and just wait for some of them to be such that the backward function converges on well the first element in s steps um, so the idea is that, well, okay, since this order is going to be ill-founded and if you apply the backward functional to any descending sequence by, by hypothesis, this will have to converge. Then if you take S large enough, you will find some finite prefix of a descending sequence on, on which the backward functional will converge. Um, the, the, the thing to be careful about now is that uh, you, the fact that the backward, the C converges, the backward functional converges, does not guarantee anything on, on the correctness of the solution. And indeed, the C may converge on things which are not going to be extendable to descending sequences. So the, the, the output it gives may be complete crap. But, um, but we can work around this. And this is where pylon unbound comes into play. And the idea is that, okay, you have like at, at each stage, you have finitely many possible descending sequences, finite, of course. Um, you can choose one uniformly. And the, and the trick is, I, I think I think a picture really explains this better. The idea is that you have like, you have your order and you have like at, at, at stage S, you have finitely many things that look as you know as candidates for solutions and you pick you choose you can uniformly choose uh, the one whose smallest element is to the is as to the right as possible like it's the greatest possible one right um the idea is that um well if any of the partial descending sequence is going to be extendable to an infinite descending sequence, then so the red one will, right? Because you can just go, you can just follow the red one and just and then, you know, drop to any of this, which is the one which is going to be extendable, right? Um, so basically you have a uniform way to pick a single candidate and you know that if something is correct, then your guess is correct. So you only need to, in a sense, you only need to uh, go um, go ahead as much as you can until you get to the point in which you are sure that something is going to be correct in your set. And this is what uh, pi one one bound is here for, because you can define the set of, of stages such that either FS is empty, so maybe you didn't see any convergence or I don't know, whatever. Um, or it's not extendable, and being extendable through, through a new, uh, through, sorry, being extendable through a linear order is 
uh, a, a sigma one one question. So being not extendable to pi one one, and this set is finite, as I said, um, because if you go like if you if you take the stage large enough, then you will see uh, a correct thing entering this set, and therefore um, you can just use pi one one bound to get a bound for this set, which basically means an index such that you are sure that you're picking something which is going to be extendable. And like, and, and such that, of course, the, 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 the function of C converges to a solution. Um, right, so, so in this case, you are, as I said, you're guaranteed that whatever C produces is going to be correct. And therefore this completes the proof, right? We have shown that we can, we only need pi one bound to get a solution for F. Um, so, right, so what does this tell us about um, DS? Well, this is what allowed us to separate DS from the problem C bear, again, of finding a path through a new standard tree. And that's just because, well, the first order part of, of, uh, of C bear is this problem, sigma one choice on the natural numbers. Um, now I wrote easy here, and because this is actually like an exercise after you know all the relevant definitions, if you want. Uh, and in particular, uh, let me tell you, like, let me say two words on this problem because this will come into play um, later. So this problem, like it's a choice problem, right? So as, as, as all the choice problem, you can phrase it as I give you some set which is non-empty and you have to pick an element. Uh, in this case, the set I, I give you is a sigma one one subset of the natural number. And sigma one one, again, the idea is that answering the question n belongs to A is a sigma one one problem in the code of, of the input. Um, and, so, and so you can see that the first order part, like the, a, a, way, a simple way to see this equivalence is that basically if you want to um, like, like, um, the idea is that being extendable for a finite string in a tree is a sigma one one problem. It's a sigma one one property. And therefore you just need to pick a finite string in your tree, which is going to be extendable. But again, being extendable is sigma one one, therefore um, just, just picking any, any string which is going to be extendable such that the backward function converges is enough. Um, this problem here will come into play later, so that's why I'm 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 saying a few words uh, about it right now. Um, on the other hand, pi one one bound can be equivalent like this again. This is an exercise. It's equivalent to uh, the problem sigma one one cofinite choice on the natural number. Well, if you want this, like intuitively, it's very it's very um, it's straightforward, right? Because Producing a bound for a pi one one set is just like choosing an element which is not in the set. So that's why sigma one and cofinite here. And it has been proved by Paul Elliott and Gled Uriak and Takayuki Hihara that this problem is strictly weaker than the, the, the sigma one choice on the natural number. And therefore, what, what we what we have is that we have two problems whose first order part is not equivalent, they cannot be equivalent. So we, and, and therefore, like we know that the, the other reduction already holds, and this means that this reduction cannot hold. Um, right, so, so now, now uh, we, can, uh, um, we can think about like separating UC, uh, sorry, yeah, UC bear from DS, and this is done uh, as I anticipated using the deterministic part. Um, now, yeah, uh, I already mentioned that limb is a problem of computing the limits in the bear space. Um, if you want, this is like um, computing the Turing jump of a prop of a, of, a, of a set, if you want. Like these are two strongly Varg equivalent problems. And what we showed, uh, is that the deterministic part of DS is exactly lim. Now, I'm not going to give you the proof of this. The main idea is essentially the same I just used to prove, um, to characterize the first order part of DS. 
So this idea of finite descending sequences, um, you, you, you just have to play a little bit with the, uh, with the thing in order to, to actually get the solution for the limb, to, to show that you can use limb uh, in case you have a single value function, but um, this is like the main ideas are, are really the same. And this is interesting because it, it, it shows that um, while DS can have very complicated solution, it only uniformly computes the limit computable functions. Um, and in particular, uh, we have this problem here, which is uh, it's the jump of LPO, uh, which is a single single valued codomain two problem. So it, I, not, not even codomain bare, right? It's a single valued codomain two. Um, which is not reducible to lim, and therefore it cannot be reducible to ds. Let alone um, uz bare, which is not even an arithmetic problem, so not really no hope for it to be um, uniformly computable by ds. Now, now uh, this problem here, I didn't define it. It's not really going to be super super interesting for us, um, but. The, intuitively, this corresponds to the problem of finding the answer to a single sigma zero two or pi zero two question. Um, therefore, the answer is zero or one. And uh, right, this is not a limit computable problem, and uh, and therefore it's not reducible to the S. Um, now we have a bunch of other characterization for what is or what is not computable from uh, uniformly computable by DS. Uh, I don't really want you to read all of this also because you know, like there are some technicalities here. Um, we we related the lower cone of DS with, you know, like Ramsey principle, like this is the um, um, Ramsey theorem for singleton. So if you want a pigeon principle in which the number of color is not specified a priori. And uh, like, for example, in this case, if you if you know that your function is going to have at most k different solution, then it's reducible to yes if and only if it's reducible to um, RT one k. So pigeon principle for k colors, and uh, right. So here we have a limit on the k element space. Right. These are like several like you have several characterization on what is and is not reducible to yes. Uh, but in order to have a clearer idea, I think it's better to draw some picture. Um, uh, I think, especially if you're not familiar with like where all these problems lands in the viral lattice, then you know all these characterization are a bunch of um, you know nonsense if you want. Um, but maybe with a picture, it's clearer. So this is like a very coarse. Um, Diagram which describes the relation between the problems in the Viral lattice. So you have the identity at the bottom here, which corresponds to computable problems. Here you have um, choice on the Cantor space, as I said, um, finding that uh, a, a path through an infinite finitely uh, binary tree, infinite binary tree. Um, limb is here, and all these iterations. Every time you Either you make a jump of limb, so you iterate, this is going to be like two limbs, three limbs, and so on. You get a strictly stronger problems. Here you have the, the whole hierarchy of pigeon principle, let's say all strictly stronger one to the other. LPO primes is here. And if you keep jumping, if you want, if you keep applying limb, then you sort of, you sort of get like a, an ascending hierarchy of problems all strictly stronger one to the other. And on top of all of them, you have UC bare, which is, um, um, which roughly corresponds to hyper arithmetic things, if you want, and strictly stronger, you have C bare. Now, as we said, like, in, in some sense, you, you might expect yes to be somewhere around here, right? Um, it's computable from C bare, not computable from UC bare, um, may have non hyperarithmetic solutions. So, you know, somewhere at the level of uh, AD or not, if you remember the connections with reverse math. Um, but all of our characterizations show that um, the S doesn't really fit this picture very well. And the thing is that, well, this is okay, the, the, just the, the first half of the diagram. Um, 
the thing is um, that we know that the S only computes the things that are below the blue line. And on the other hand, by transitivity, we know it does not compute LPO prime and therefore does not compute anything above the red line. In particular, ADS here, I mentioned it at the beginning of the talk, uh, is going to be in incomparable with the S. And well, as you can see from the picture, there's a guy who's left out of the picture, which is KL. Um, we really don't know what's happening about KL. Um, KL corresponds to Koenig's lemma and can be phrased as um, given an infinite finitely branching tree produce a path. Um, or if you want that this is equivalent to the jump of the of weak Koenig's lemma, so the choice in Cantor space. Um, so given a sequence of given a sequence in the breath space converging to a binary, an infinite binary tree, produce a path through the limit tree. We don't really know, like, the, for, for, like somehow KL dodged all of our characterization. So none of our, no, none of our theorem actually applies to KL and we don't really know whether DS computes it or not. And well, I think this is a good moment to have a short break because um, the second, second, the second part of the talk I'll be, I'll be talking about possible generalizations of these problems, of this problem DS, and in particular in the case where we consider weaker inputs, like weaker representation for the uh, input linear order. Okay, thanks. Uh, let, let's see, see if there are any questions so far, maybe before taking the break. Okay, let, let, let's take our break. I think we can we could start again at 5.30. I think this is a, a no, like an eight minute break. Okay, yeah. we start again at, at 5.30 then. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so, um, um, right, so as I anticipated, like the problem now is going to be uh, what happens is um, what happens if um, instead of just consider like the idea is that we want to generalize the problem and the question is what happens instead of um, describing the input linear order as the characteristic function, right? So, um, so exactly telling you what is in relation which with what else? Uh, what happens if I consider a weaker representation of the order? Um, so to be uh, a bit more precise, um, did what what we what we do is the following: we consider a, a, a class like gamma, which is going to be um, sigma zero k, pi zero k, or a, 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 we will never go beyond the level of uh, sigma one one pi one one or delta one one, and we consider the represented spaces of gamma linear order and gamma quasi orders. Um, now, this again, the trick um, is uh, is pretty much the same we used in the case of the natural numbers, right? When I said um, pi one one subset of the natural number, well, um, what is the input? Well, it's a code, it's a string such that answering the question whether n belongs to a is a pi one one question relative to this. Oracle, if you want, this code. And same happens here, right? So now answering the question A is less than or equal than B um, is not going to be a computable problem, a computable problem in the input, but it's going to be a gamma problem in the input. Um, the, like this trick can be done for, for any represented space, of course, right? There's there's a formal way to um, to describe this. Uh, this space here as a gamma, uh, sorry, as a represented space, uh, doesn't matter, right? The, the main idea is the following, is what I said. You you can think of the problem of, like, you can think of the input such that answering, checking the relation between two elements is uh, gamma. And therefore, like, we can define the problem gamma ds and gamma bs, um, which essentially is the same problem so this definition here tells you that the problem is essentially the same, right? You still want 
a descending sequence through a linear order in the first case and the bad sequence through a non well quasi order in the second case. But now the, the representation of the input is what changes. And therefore, like having, having a weaker representation for your order, it's clear that um, it, th these are harder problems, right? It, it's harder to extract information on your order from the code. Um, so all of a sudden we have a bunch of new problems, um, which, I mean, it's not really clear how they relate to each, to each other, right? Um, except for the trivial ones. So every, for example, every um, linear order is a quasi order, right? So, and every, and every bad sequence through a linear order is actually a descending sequence. And therefore, like this reduction here is trivial. Um, if you take like any, if you take gamma subset of gamma prime in this case, um, it's it's easy to see that um, any, for example, any sigma zero k um, linear order is actually a um, delta k plus one linear order, and therefore uh, the reduction, this reduction is trivial, and and so on, right? Um, but it's it's not clear what happens in general, like among all of them. So this is pretty much a diagram like of, of what I was saying, right? You have a bunch of of, of new problems. And you don't really know what what, what happens uh, between them. Now, um, I don't want to really talk too much in details about what happens uh, among like all the problems of this uh, so-called arithmetic, if you want um, DS hierarchy. But let me just tell you, like, in in uh, very, very rather shortly, what what happens. Uh, basically, we have that. Um, the, the delta classes, they all collapse together. They are equivalent. Um, this is basically just um, relativizing the argument we use in the, um, in, the base, in the base case, which is the, like the delta zero one case. Uh, if you want delta zero one ds, it's just ds, right? So um, if you relativize delta zero k, you get that um, all the delta classes are actually equivalent. Um, we show that uh, these two classes, like the, the pi zero k classes, actually collapse to the higher level. Um, in other words, you can you can take a, a delta zero k plus one linear order and just produce a pi zero k um, linear order, um, such that the descending sequence through the through the linear order actually computes the descending sequence through the original one. And uh, the sigma zero k orders collapse, sorry, linear orders collapse to the lower level. Um, this is actually very easy. This is just like, again, this is a classical argument, uh, which we just phrased in the context of our flexibility. It's just the idea is that you just um, pair your element with the stage in which the element enters the set, enters the order, right? So, um, and therefore you see that uh, it's like, you actually, you actually have this, this equivalent this is um, actually easy. And so to, to summarize what happens in the arithmetic case, let's say that this is a like uh, condensed version of the diagram. Uh, I stopped here, I stopped here at sigma zero two BS because it's just like, it just repeats all over. What I wanted to mention here is that, well, first of all, uh, mm, Dashed arrow, sorry, uh, dashed arrow here means virus reduction, and solid arrows means strict virus reduction. So uh, we know, for example, that this problem is going to be strictly stronger than this one. Um, in particular, and and this is and this holds for every k, right? So in particular, this shows that uh, this this hierarchy does not collapse at any finite level. Um, but we don't really know uh, what happens what happens at this between these two classes, right? We don't really know whether sigma zero one ds is actually able to um, compute delta zero two ds, right? Whether it reaches the higher level. Let me also mention that all of these problems are incomparable with UC bear. So if you want, this is a, like a whole hierarchy uh, which. It's still, still, it is um, sort of 
on the side of the classic picture of you know the the Varnhladis as you may may think of it. Um, these are all problems which are very hard to solve, but that do not solve much. And actually, since we mentioned LPO prime before, um, the um, the technique we use to separate these two and then like separate all of the sigma zero k uh, bs from sigma zero k ds is, is that um, well sigma zero one bs is actually able to compute LPO prime. While well, this guy we said we said that DS is not able, and then and then you go up if you want you go up by jumps, um, this can be made formal actually we proved it, but uh, like intuitively at each level sigma zero KBS computes um, the kth jump of LPO while sigma zero KDS is not able to. Um, moreover, let me let me actually um, tell you a bit more of. What happens here? Uh, so let me zoom in if you want in this part of the diagram, and I will uh, highlight um, a few a few problems which we actually left open in the paper. Um, so on top of like if if all of these problems are not enough, let me introduce a few more. Right? Um, let me consider the problem gamma ds lqo. LQO stands for linearly or uh, linear quasi order, um, which essentially, well, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a total quasi order, right? Uh, it means that if you want the um, equivalence classes are linearly ordered, or if you want, you have no anti chains, right? Um, so essentially, um, if you restrict your gamma BS problem to linear quasi order, well. You are actually asking just for descending sequences, and that's why I just mentioned DSLQO here. And and the other one is gamma BS PO. PO is um, of course stands for uh, partial orders, so it's a restriction of BS for partial orders. And and again, for partial orders, you don't really ask for descending sequences. Uh, we know that asking for descending sequences in a partial order is already too strong. It's 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 basically like asking. It's basically C bear, right? It's it's basically like asking uh, for a path through an unfounded tree. Um, and so so if you consider these two problems, what actually happens here is the following. So we actually what we actually proved is that sigma zero one ds lqo is able to compute lpo prime. Uh, so what, what we really used in this in this thing here, in this uh, non-reduction here, basically, um, is the fact that at any finite stage, we are able, like, since the, since the code for the input linear order is sigma zero one, uh, basically it means that we can, at any finite stage, we can just say, oh, you know what? Just forget about everything. Just everything you've done so far, Forget it. Like collapse everything to a single equivalence class, and just start over. Right? And start to be maybe you put this this new like this single equivalence class at the bottom of your order, or at the top, or like uh, uh, depend on what you want to do. Um, and then and then you start over. You start building like an entirely new uh, order. And this is what we use to 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 actually compute that PO prime. But we never really used. The fact that we can have anti chains, um, so that's why all these reductions are actually bashed, right? The, the, these are Viroc reduction for trivial reasons, right? Because every linear order is a partial order, every partial order is a, it's a quasi order, and so on. Uh, but we don't really know what's the exact relation between all these problems, which um, I think it's an interesting question. Well, uh, many interesting questions. And let me let me mention that we like our results implicitly uh, solve these questions for the delta classes, of course, but also for the pi classes, because the pi zero one ds uh, problem collapsed to the higher level to delta zero two d to delta zero k plus one ds, and and therefore like they all collapse. But in the sigma case, we don't really know what, what hap what's happening. And yeah, I think I think I think these are interesting questions. Um, 
but yeah, this is pretty much what I wanted to, to tell you about the, let's say, the arithmetic part of the, of the hierarchy. Uh, we have several, several results, several characterizations. I mean, most of them are somewhat uh, technical, so that's why I'm not really mentioning them. Uh, like I'm not really uh, stating the theorem or or proving it, um, but yeah, this, like the core of the results is, the, is what I said, right? Um, what I wanted to do, to do, what I wanted to do in the remaining part of the talk is actually um, talk a little bit more about uh, what happens beyond the arithmetic classes. Um, so first of all, first first non-arithmetic level is delta one one, of course. Um, so at the delta one one level, we are finally able to compute UC bear. So this is actually the first level in which we actually, let's say we enter the picture if you want. We finally enter between UC bear and C bear. We will see, uh, in a second, I will tell you the relation with, with C bear. But for now, let me just mention that you, we, with delta one DS, you are finally able to compute UC bear. Um, this operation here, uh, I did mention it at the beginning. It's the idea that you can use UC bear, then do something computable, and then <clears throat> and then apply the S. And this is actually equivalent to delta one one, essentially because UC bear um, is uh, sufficient to um, to translate a delta one one code for a linear order into a computable. So delta zero one code for the linear order. So actually, it's it suffice it suffices to compute the characteristic function of the order given a delta one one code, um, and and that's that's basically one and a half of the reduction, and, and the other just um, um, the other follows for other reasons I'm not mentioning now. Um, it does not reach the level of C bar yet. Um, so unfortunately, so, so this guy enters the picture, but it, it's strictly between UC bear and C bear. And again, the trick we use to, to show this is, is by means of the first order part. Uh, again, the, we, we characterize the first order part of delta one one ds, uh, which I'm not writing it. I'm not writing it here um, because it's 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 not really. <laughs> Let's say it's not really clear what it is, but um, from an intuitive point of view. But uh, we we prove that whatever it is, it does not compute c one one c n, and therefore still delta one ds is uh, it's not at the level of c bar. So at this point, you may ask, okay, let's try to compute this guy first. Can we? What, what do we need to compute c one one c n? Well, I mean. Likely or unlikely, I don't know. It depends on the point of view. Um, we 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 get to compute a sigma one C n, and actually it's it's infinite parallelization using sigma one D s. Um, so so now sigma one D s again. We ask, does it reach the level of C bear? And again, the answer is no. But to answer, but answering this question is really uh, it's really not trivial. And I will tell you more about this. In particular, uh, let me talk a bit more about this problem here, sigma one C N parallelized. Um, so as I mentioned uh, before, um, Takayuki, Alberto, and Arno they uh, they studied a bunch of possible analogs of ATR not in the bar lattice. They considered many different problems and tried to uh, characterize its bar their bar degrees. Um, in particular, they showed that um, this problem here, the parallelization of sigma one C N is um, between U C bear and C bear. And, and they left open whether, whether this reduction is strict or not. Um, they didn't solve it. They left it as an open question in their paper. And th sorry, <laughs> this paper, uh, sorry, this question was um, later uh, answered by again by Paul Elliott and, and Takayuki um, was was answered negatively. Uh, they proved that indeed this problem is strictly weaker than the choice in the base phase, um, 
And to do so, they exploited another problem, which is this one, this ATR2 now, this ATR2 here, um, which is computable by CBAR, and, and they proved that it's not computable by this parallelization. Um, so, okay, so what is ATR2? Now, ATR2 uh, co somewhat corresponds to one of the possible ways you can trace um, the main axiom of ATR0, if you want, or the main axiom um, in the context of biocredibility. So, um, well, ATR, ATR is, uh, when I said main axiom, I mean the fact that um, you can iterate any arithmetic formula um, on, on a, on a, on a well-classy order. This is, this is what uh, arithmetic transfinite recursion means. Um, but but when you study this axiom from if you want from the point of view of reverse math, um, there's a known phenomenon which is uh, very uh, delicate, which is the phenomenon of pseudo well orders. So what may happen is that when you work in a particular um, submodels of second order arithmetic, um, you have ill-founded linear orders which from the point of view of the model appear as well ordered just because the all of the descending sequences um, are not in the in the model in the model themselves so basically what happens is that okay the model sees the linear order sees no descending sequence not because there is none but because they are more complicated than what the model has and therefore it thinks it's it thinks it's it's a well order but instead it's not and that's why they are called pseudo well orders. Um, so Junlo, uh, in his in his PhD thesis, he introduced this problem, which uh, can be the problem ATR two, which can be phrased as follows: um, Give you a linear order, which you, uh, I mean, you have no guarantee that it's going to be uh, well founded or not, uh, and you have either to produce a descending sequence to it, okay. But on the other hand, you may want to produce a jump hierarchy support on, supported on the set. Now, jump hierarchy, I mean, um, uh, I didn't define this uh, formally, but the idea is that um, you basically, the, the, the arithmetic formula you iterate over your order is the formula defining the jump, the Turing jump, right? So that's why it's called jump hierarchy. Um, uh, a technical thing, like a small technical thing, which doesn't really matter much, is the fact that ATR2 also um, gives you a bit indicating whether it, it's producing a descending sequence or a jump hierarchy. So it also, like, like not only tells you, uh, it gives you an infinite string, it, it also tells you what it is producing. Um, and, and he proved that this problem is strictly between C bear and UC bear. Um, even 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 arithmetically, like that doesn't matter. But yeah, it's it's a uh, strictly between UC bear and C bear. Um, so so the reason why we are interested in ATR two here and before to uh, sigma one choice here, it's it basically rests on the, the technique uh, Godoyak and Chiara used to separate these two problems. Basically, extending this technique we um, managed to prove a stronger result that, and namely we proved that not even Sigma one DS is able to um, compute ATR2. Um, this in particular implies that um, Sigma one DS does not reach the level of CBER and also answers, uh, provides an alter well, alternative answer to uh, the question raised by um, Alberto, Arno and Takayuki. So the proof is based on the following result. Uh, this um, a theorem Jinlo puts in his thesis. It's all, in turn, it's based on um, an unpublished result by Harrington. Um, and, and this result can be stated as follows. Um, let WF here be the set of indices for well-founded linear orders. Um, okay, on, on the other hand, you fix the, the set here, HDS, as the set of indices for linear orders with hyperarithmetic descending sequences. Um, what the theorem says is that 
well, first of all, these two these two sets are clearly disjoint, right? If you're well founded, you have no descending sequence, and you and and vice versa, right? So, uh, but the theorem says that any sigma one set separating uh, these two problems, uh, these two sets, is actually complete. Um, so this is what what we're going to show, right? We're going to exploit the theorem, so we are going to show that if there is a reduction of ATR two to sigma one one ds, we would be able to compute a delta one one set separating WF and HDS, right? Separating the well-founded orders from the uh, orders with at least an hyperarithmetic descending sequence. Mario, it, yep. it may be worth mentioning that those two sets are actually both pi one one. Uh, and so, and so the statement is saying that, in particular, also it's saying that uh, they cannot be separated by any Borel, by any delta one one set. Oh, any right. Yeah. Set. yeah. Yeah, pi one one because the quantification of hype is actually behaving the, the other way. I mean, this is an ex existential quantification on hype, which behaves like a universal quantification. Yeah, and on the other hand, being well founded is, is clearly is trivially like it's known to be pi one one. So yeah, yeah. Um, right. So so let's try to prove to prove our theorem. Like let let, let me let me try to um, to dig through the proof. Right. So again, well, first of all, assume by contradiction that there is a reduction and. We, we we know already that we can assume that the reduction is strong, so that the backward function only takes an input a descending sequence, not really the original input. It's not going to matter much, but you know it's just for for keeping things simple. And this is basically what happens in the reduction, right? You start from a linear order, which is the input from ATR two, and now like be careful of this is like a, a bit tricky at at least the first times yeah, because the inputs for ATR2 and the input for C11DS, they are both linear orders, right? So uh, you, you should try not to, not to mix the two, right? So LE is, a, is an input for ATR2. Then you apply the forward function, the PSI here, to build a linear order, which is going to be the input for C11DS. Uh, then you apply C11DS to get a descending sequence Q. You apply the backward function to Q, and now you get an answer to ADR2, to the original problem. Um, now, I mean, I, I wrote LE, LE here because uh, what we will what we will use are basically just um, the set of computable linear orders, right? We will not need anything else that um, computable linear orders. Um, so, right, so, okay, so by, by definition of virus reducibility, well, when you apply C to, to a descending sequence through this order, then you either have to produce a descending sequence through the original order LE, or a jump hierarchy supported on LE. Um, well, plus a bit coding, coding which one you're producing. But this is not, like, there's no loss in generality because you can just always assume that, you know, maybe you put the DS on the events and uh, the jump arc and the odds, and therefore, like, you can always computably, um, computably uh, find out whether you are producing a descending sequence or a jump arc anyway. Um, so, as an additional convenience, let me just uh, introduce this um, less than W here. Um, this is actually like this reduction. This notion here it actually has a name. It's called Muchnik reduction. For those of you who are familiar with this, uh, if you are not, doesn't matter. We because we like we will not really dig into the, the theory of Medvedev of Muchnik degrees or whatever. We just use this um, this definition here because we will just exploit the art. Uh, let's say the, um, the, the the complexity of this definition here. Um, so what is saying what what this thing is saying is that every element B in capital B, for every element B in capital B, there is an I, which is the index of a of a computable functional, such that if you apply um, phi I to B to this fixed element, you get an element of A. Um, in other words, you can just say that 
every like a, a, a short way to say this is that every element of B computes uh, possibly non-uniformly an element of A. So there's no uniformity required here. You you can have a different function for for every B, uh, but you know that every B has is a is a is, a, is, a, is its own function. Um, now let me notice that if A is a, it's an arithmetic set and B is at most sigma one one. Then this condition here, the reduction here, is a pi one one condition. That's well, basically this is um, dominated by this universal quantifier here, uh, and then this membership relation here is arithmetic because A is arithmetic. Um, and this a is and like, B are sets of natural numbers, right? Capital A and capital B. Uh, are no, sets no, 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 no. You can take them as subsets of the bare space. So, yeah, yeah, no, good point. Um, this is a Turing function, right? So you 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 can think of it as a as a as a function from the bare space to the bare space, and these are subsets of the natural of the bare space, and well, okay. So these are a relation between subsets of the bare space. Um, I should have mentioned it probably. Um, so let me notice that being a descending sequence through a sigma one one order. Is actually a sigma one, one property. This is this is based on the fact that the order is a linear order. The input order is a linear order, and so uh, being strictly less is actually sigma one. Uh, if you if you if you are not a linear order, you're quasi order. Then being strictly less becomes more complicated becomes delta, delta one two. Um, but but since we are in a linear order, then being strictly less is like being less than or equal and being different. So this is sigma one as well. Um, plus, uh, well, of course, being a descending sequence from a linear order is uh, is a pi zero one uh, property, as I said, as I mentioned before. But also being a jump hierarchy through, uh, like supported on on a, on a linear order, is an arithmetic property. It's, it's a pi zero two problem uh, property, if I remember correctly. But doesn't matter. It's arithmetic, right? Um, so so this is like this is going to be important, right? Because we will then apply this um, relation here to these sets and therefore we will get like we will let's say in, in our mind we will have b being this set here and a being one of these two here so that this relation will, will be actually pi one one but we will see it in a bit like you don't have to remember it just just to mention um, the the key lemma we we exploited to to carry out the proof is the following uh, assuming you have a reduction of course then um, for every E, for every computable linear order, either the set of um, descending sequence through the linear order or the jump higher, the set of jump hierarchy through the linear order is mutually reducible to the set of solution to sigma one ds. Um, and the proof basically, like, like the proof basically exploits the fact that you can combine, non uniformly combine two descending sequences to make one. Uh, let, let me let me let me explain it better. Um, so well, okay. So let's let's prove the lemma, right? So assume not. Um, assume you, you this doesn't hold. You don't have this reduction here. Um, by definition, this means that um, you have two uh, descending sequence through this order p of a e. Uh, one is p and one is q, and p does not compute any descending sequence. Through LE and Q does not compute any jump hierarchy on LE, um, right? Because if all the sequences compute the descending sequence, then you have a reduction. That's what I'm saying. Um, but uh, since we have a reduction from ATR2 to sigma one ds, this also this in particular means that P P P does not compute any descending sequence, right? So it has to compute a jump hierarchy. Uh, and on the other hand, Q does not compute a jump hierarchy, so it has to compute a descending sequence. Um, now, let me let me really hand wave, let's say, the proof because um, the technical details are going to be like just just not more, uh, let's say, uh, not clear than than just two lines drawn as a, as a diagram, right? So, so let me just mention what happens in like if you want a little bit and waiting. Um, 
if you have t these two descending sequences, these two P and Q here, and of course, like the the the, the thing that the, the fact that I put them that I drew that I drew, drew them this way, it's not really relevant. You can always um, swap them. It doesn't it doesn't have to be uniform in any way. Uh, but if you have two uh, descending sequences like this, you will always be able, again, non-uniformly, uh, to, um, let's say, run, let's say, follow the, the one to the right, as long as the backward functional computes uh, the first bit of the solution. So it commits to either a descending sequence or a jump hierarchy. In this case, uh, P computes jump hierarchies, right? So, uh, so if you apply the backward functional to P, then at any uh, at a certain finite stage, it will have to say, okay, listen, I will produce a jump hierarchy from now on, um, right? But then the trick is that you can uh, just let's say replace the tail with the, with the, with the, with with Q, right? We can with the tail of Q. For us, like in other ways, you can shave off um, prefixes from descending sequence, from descending sequences in a computable way because um, pre finite prefixes are computable, um, so that you force basically the um, backward function to produce either a jump hierarchy or a descending sequence. Um, in other words, this means that if you if you do this trick, then it means that the tail of Q has to compute a jump hierarchy. Uh, but then it, it means that you only need to, to you know, replace a finite initial prefix of Q in order to compute a jump hierarchy from Q. And this is absolutely a, a computable operation. It's absolutely non-uniform, right? You don't have any way to know this in advance. Um, you may need, let's say, swap the roles if you want. So you, you may need to uh, actually shave off a prefix of P and therefore compute a descending sequence instead. But um, it, it doesn't matter, right? The, the thing I'm, I'm, I want to show that is that at least uh, one of these two things is false, right? At least either either Q computes descending sequences or P computes a jump, uh, sorry. I want to show that either Q computes a jump hierarchy, contradicting this thing, or Q P computes a descending sequence contradicting this thing here. Um, right, so in, the way I, I, I drew the diagram means that this, this thing, in, in, in this case, Q computes a jump hierarchy and this is a contradiction. Um, again, I hope that drawing a diagram was clearer than just writing a bunch of um, symbols, I mean, at least I feel that for me it was when I would like this is the way I I thought of the, of the solution I thought of for uh, say um, I, I thought about like solving this problem but um, yeah um, right so so what we proved is that um, either DS again either DS or JIH of LE is mutually reducible to um, to the to the set of solutions. In other words, every descending sequence through either every descending sequence through P of E computes a descending sequence, or every descending sequence computes a jump hierarchy. Um, and now we are um, getting to the end of the proof um, because, like now, the trick is consider these two sets here. The first one is the set of indices such that DS does not reduce, and the other one is the set of indices such that JH does not reduce. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, reducing, uh, that's what I wrote here, the reduction is a pi 1 1 condition, like the existence of a reduction is a pi 1 1 condition, and therefore the existence of a non reduction is a sigma 1 1 condition. So, so, sorry, the fact that there's no reduction is a sigma one one condition. So these two sets are sigma one one. Um, moreover, um, the set W have 
WF here um, is actually a subset of this thing. And, and that's just because um, if, you, if you pick an E, which is, a well, which is the index of a well-founded order, then of course it has no descending sequences. And, um, and if you have no descending sequence, then I mean, uh, the empty set does not uh, mention it reducible, reduces to anything, right? There, there's no, like you, you cannot compute anything which belongs to the empty set, right? Let's put it in another way. Um, on the other hand, um, this is maybe uh, more more tricky. Um, the the set of um, set, the set of indices with a hyper arithmetic descending sequence um, is contained in this set, and this actually follows from a uh, result by Friedman uh, because it showed that if a set if a sorry if a linear order supports an hyper arithmetic descending sequence. I realize now that it would have been better to 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 to, to write this theorem uh, explicitly, but uh, the theorem of Friedman says that if a linear order um, has an hyperarithmetic descending sequence, um, then it does not support any jump hierarchy. Uh, this is not trivial. This is a result by Friedman, uh, but this is what we uh, exploited here to 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 prove this. Um, the fact that the HDS is, is a subset of this thing, right? Because in that case, um, JH is the empty set, and again, the empty set, you cannot compute anything which belongs to the empty set. Uh, and so we are finally to, we are finally uh, got to a contradiction because we showed that, um, well, these two sets are disjoint, and that's essentially what, what the lemma says, right? Um, because you either compute one or compute the other, and therefore um, there's no E that does not compute both. Like for no E, the, the two no reduction holds, and therefore uh, the two sets are disjoint. They are sigma one one. So by sigma one one separation, um, there has to be an hyperarithmetic set separating WF and HDS, which is a contradiction against um, Gillow, Gillow's theorem. Um, um, right, so this concludes the proof. Uh, this shows that ATR2 does not reduce to sigma 1ds, and therefore that sigma 1ds is yet again um, strictly below C bear. Um, now, a last a few words to conclude the talk. Uh, and maybe it was a little bit faster than I expected, but a few words to to Conclude the talk is um, let me let me just tell you what happens uh, if you go even beyond right uh, because there are still a few problems which are left out of the picture and in particular uh, I'm gonna say okay what if you, what if you uh, consider a strictly uh, like an even stronger problem like sigma one bs or pi one one ds right um, in fact it turns out that they are much stronger um, and right so so they will they will they they happen to be if you want at the level of pi one one comprehension. So let me let me introduce this problem here, which well pi one one comprehension. I already I already somewhat um, introduced this problem, even if I wrote it as the parallel the parallelization of the characteristic function of well-founded trees. Right, that's essentially what's written here. Uh, the problem pi one one comprehension can be thought of the problem. Um, Given a sequence of trees, some trees of the bare space, um, you just have to say which ones are ill founded and which ones are well founded. So you have to produce an element of the counter space telling you exactly which ones are uh, well founded. Um, so what we showed is that uh, actually both sigma 1 bs and uh, pi 1 ds are able to compute this pi one comprehension problem. Uh, in fact, what we showed is that we can uh, we can use both both of them to um, compute the leftmost path of an ill founded tree. This is well known to be um, to be to be a, one of the analogs of um, of pi one comprehension, especially in reverse math. 
uh, but but also like from from the point of view of partial disability, there's not really uh, much of a difference. So um, um, so this is uh, this is actually equivalent to pi one one comprehension, and and therefore we show that uh, that these two problems are actually way on top, way like <laughs> like if you want way higher up. There there's a huge gap between sigma one one ds and pi sigma one bs. Um, so this is a picture, like a short, small picture, um, uh, summarizing all the results, all the results for the non-arithmetic classes. Um, as I said, uh, delta one, one ds is the first one that enters the picture. Then you have sigma one ds, strictly, strictly stronger. Both of them are strictly below uh, choice on the bare space, which is like there's a huge gap here separating C bare from pi one one comprehension, and um, well, huge, well, relatively huge, let's say. It depends on, on, on the point of view. Um, gap separating C bear from pi one comprehension, then you have these two problems uh, right on top of all of the others. And um, yeah. So I stop here. Um, I leave you with a few references. Uh, in particular, this this is the paper um, uh, we wrote together with Jinla and Arno. And um, yeah, thank you very much. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer if I can. Thank you very much uh, for your talk, Mario. I think it was nice that uh, that went in quite detail through that proof that uses also some element of descriptive set theory, let's say, to get a, a result in, in in computability. So, are there any questions or comments? Okay, so the natural question about the, your last diagram is uh, whether you have any hunch for whether those two principles are actually equivalent to pi one one comprehension or actually properly stronger. Uh, I don't. The short answer is I don't really know. <laughs> uh, well, the truth is that um, I mean, you will know, right? Um, there's not much like there's not much known at the level of pi one comprehension from the point of view of virtual disability. Um, well, we are starting to get some. We are some we are starting to get a few a few candidates like at that level. A uh, few guys we can actually compare sigma one bs to right, but um, the truth is that we were uh, we we really didn't know right at, at that time. Uh, we were just you know exploring all the possible. Um, generalization. When we when we found out that these two problems were so much beyond what 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 studied so far, we we basically stopped. Right. We. So maybe this is a, a good idea to to go back to these now that we know a little bit more about. Right. 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 No, no, that, that's 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 definitely a good point. And and uh, I mean, I I did try to you know uh, see whether there was something let's say easy or relatively easy you could say about. Uh, whether they are equivalent to pi one comprehension, whether uh, what's the relation between these two problems, right? Um, so it's the only like a, a simple, if you want, upper bound for at least pi one one ds is certainly pi one one choice on the base space. Um, the set of solution through a pi one one linear order is pi one one, and therefore, if you have pi one one choice, you can just pick a solution, right? Um, but then again, okay, we know that. Sophia, yeah. all right. If I, there are no other questions, I uh, I think we can thank our uh, speaker Malio again. I think it was a very nice talk. I think we are meeting again next Friday, and our speaking is Rizos Klinos, if I'm correct. I got the right information from the from the website. So again, the same time on, at the same link, <laughs> and uh, have a nice weekend, everybody.